So here we're going to talk about the acute management of seizures. This lecture is titled Status Epilepticus. By definition, Status Epilepticus is a seizure that's lasted for 30 minutes or longer, but we always assume Status Epilepticus if the seizure has gone on for five minutes. So really what we're uh, talking about here is acute management of seizures. Uh, this is not going to be a uh, whole talk on epilepsy. Uh, I addressed epilepsy in a different section. So this is not going to be talking about the long-term management of seizures. This is going to be talking about the acute management, the emergency management of a seizure that is lasting uh, longer than five minutes. Okay, so status epilepticus is a state of continuous seizure activity, either partial or generalized, lasting 30 minutes or longer. Now, we don't really ever talk about status epilepticus in the partial seizure form. That's really kind of rare, and it's not as much of a medical emergency as is uh, convulsive generalized status epilepticus. Uh, so when, uh, from here on out, when I say status epilepticus, uh, I'm only referring to convulsive status epilepticus. We should always assume status epilepticus at five minutes of seizure activity or longer. So even though it has to last 30 minutes or longer, we are absolutely not waiting 30 minutes to treat uh, or to intervene. Uh, we will always assume status epilepticus at five minutes or longer, uh, and we're going to start our therapy before then. The number one cause of uh, a status epilepticus seizure is non-compliance with an anti-epileptic drug in a patient who has epilepsy. Now think about it. If you have epilepsy and you are on an anti-epileptic drug, quickly withdrawing yourself, not taking your seizure medications is going to dramatically increase your risk for seizures because your seizure threshold goes up as you take uh, as you take your anti-epileptic drugs. So even though, yes, it is therapeutic to take your, uh, your seizure medication, the seizure medication is also going to increase your seizure threshold because you do have, uh, you will develop a, uh, a tolerance for that medication. So stopping the medication suddenly uh, is, uh, is a, a huge risk. There are about 152,000 cases in the U.S. per year of status epilepticus, resulting in about 42,000 deaths. So this is a big deal. The case mortality rate is about 22%. So 22% of patients who have seizures lasting longer than 30 minutes actually will die from it. The first item to address when you have a patient who is seizing is your ABCs, and that goes for pretty much any medical emergency, as status epilepticus is. Particularly, we're going to focus on airway management. Generally, for the first minute of a seizure, the tonic phase, the patient's not breathing. Now, a minute of not breathing is usually not going to kill you, uh, but we have to keep an eye on saturation because if, uh, if the uh, respiratory uh, problems continue longer than that, uh, you certainly can desaturate to the point where it can cause some serious problems. Okay, so let's say that uh, we're going to assume here that the patient is in the hospital. Uh, as far as first aid, I'll give you some hints about that later on, but here we're going to assume the patient is in the hospital or we have arrived to the patient uh, outside of the hospital uh, as a paramedic and you have uh, you have things that you can do for them, you have medications, etc. So the first thing to do, of course, is ABCs. You're going to get your vitals, um, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, uh, and so forth. Respiratory arrest presents the first threat, so that's really the first thing we need to be thinking about. You should ensure that the patient is breathing. If they're not breathing, you, you're really concerned about that. Monitor oxygen saturation if possible. Outside of the hospital, oftentimes it's really difficult to have any kind of oxygen saturation monitoring, um, but if it's possible, you should be monitoring their oxygen saturation. In the hospital, you have no excuse. You should always be doing that. You should begin high flow oxygen as quickly as possible. 
in most instances, this is going to have to be by face mask, and that's just because uh, if the patient is thrashing about, it's going to be hard to keep a nasal cannula in place. So a face mask is going to be uh, our, our, uh, our mode of choice. EKG monitoring should also be uh, established as quickly as possible, and that's because one of the complications of uh, status epilepticus is arrhythmia. We should be establishing IV access as soon as possible, and that's because our medications that we administer are going to be IV. So usually we're going to do this as quickly as possible, not at five minutes. We should be doing this as quickly as we can, as soon as we can. Laboratories should be drawn, CBC, CMP, toxicology, and anti-epileptic drug levels. Usually we're not going to get those anti-epileptic drug levels right away. Those oftentimes have to be sent out. But the CBC, CMP, and toxicology, uh, we can get those uh, really quickly. And that's going to be uh, to uh, differentiate what the diagnosis is for the cause of the seizure. We should always consider hypoglycemia immediately. So you should get a, uh, a finger prick glucose level. If you can't get the glucose level immediately, then you need to assume hypoglycemia. And you're just going to administer 50 milliliters of uh, dextrose 50 with thiamine. So hypoglycemia is a very common cause of seizures and it's very easily reversible. So if you can't get the glucose levels, then you should just assume they have hypoglycemia because you're not gonna harm the patient by giving them some sugar. Nobody was ever harmed by uh, a 50 milliliter amp of sugar. So you're gonna give them that glucose and you're going to add, and this is very, very important, you're going to add thiamine. The USMLE likes to give you choices and say glucose or glucose plus thiamine. You're going to give them thiamine in addition to the glucose. The reason is, you don't know this patient. If they're an alcoholic, not giving them thiamine, uh, if you're giving them glucose without thiamine, can put them at risk for Wernicke's encephalopathy. And that is a bad, bad thing. So we're always going to give them glucose or dextrose with thiamine. At five minutes, you should administer your first round of benzodiazepines. IV lorazepam is usually given uh, just because it's uh, at five minutes, it's usually the EMTs who are there, and lorazepam does not require refrigeration. So lorazepam is usually the drug that's given, but certainly other benzodiazepines are okay too. Diazepam is given, uh, midazolam is given. Diazepam is good because it can be given through the rectal route, which sounds kind of unpleasant, but if you haven't been able to establish an IV access, the rectal route is a very, very useful route to administer a benzodiazepine. Okay, at 10 minutes, you're going to continue monitoring their ABCs, of course. At 10 minutes, you can also administer a second round of benzodiazepines. So lorazepam is the most commonly used uh, anti-epileptic drug, uh, but certainly other anti-epileptic, or sorry, benzodiazepines can be used too. So lorazepam, uh, diazepam, midazolam are probably the most commonly used. In the hospital setting at this point, you may consider administering uh, the anti-epileptic drug phosphenitoin. Um, you can do that at 15 minutes too, but at uh, 10 minutes is, uh, is optimal if, if you have, uh, if, if it is available. And phosphenitoin is uh, simply a, a better IV preparation of phenytoin. Phenytoin can be really, really damaging to the veins. So phosphenytoin is preferable to phenytoin. And when you're administering phosphenytoin and after you've administered phosphenytoin, you should watch out for hypotension. At 15 minutes, you need to administer IV phosphenytoin. Of course, watch for hypotension. And if the patient has been seizing for 15 minutes, you should begin to prepare for impending mechanical intubation. At that point, it is very possible that you may need to do that. It's possible you may need to do that beforehand. If they begin to compensate uh, in their respiratory saturation, then you're going to need to intubate them uh, 
as soon as that happens. But at 15 minutes, even if their saturations are good, you should be getting them ready for mechanical intubation. And the reason for that is because uh, you may need to administer general anesthesia to get them out of their, uh, out of their seizure and general anesthesia requires intubation. So uh, you should always be prepared to uh, intubate the patient, but at 15 minutes, you should really, really be prepared. And also at 15 minutes, somebody should be calling anesthesia and somebody should be calling the ICU. At 20 minutes, you should be administering IV phenobarbital. What's phenobarbital? Phenobarbital is a barbiturate. It's different from a benzodiazepine. So it's a little bit stronger, it's a little bit more dangerous, but uh, at 20 minutes, you should be administering IV phenobarbital. You should also insert Foley catheter and start IV fluids if they haven't been started yet, and that is uh, going in uh, to the fact that we're probably going to be, uh, we're, we're probably going to be uh, giving this patient general anesthesia. And once the anesthesiologist gets there, then you can do rapid sequence intubation and administer general anesthesia, usually with propofol. You are never going to do rapid sequence intubation plus general anesthesia with propofol. That is done by the anesthesiologist, okay? So again, even though I have a disclaimer on my homepage for all of these lectures, as far as using this stuff in real life, this is for the USMLE, not for real life, maybe useful in real life. This is for the USMLE. Unless you are an anesthesiologist, you're never going to order propofol for the patient, and usually you won't be allowed to. So uh, even, even as a uh, general practitioner, uh, you're not going to be giving propofol. This is going to be done by an anesthesiologist. And that's why you called anesthesia at 15 minutes. They better be get, getting there within five minutes. So general anesthesia is done by an anesthesiologist. But you should know that it is part of uh, the management of status epilepticus. During care, so during uh, while you're taking care of the patient, while they're having their seizure, after their seizure, you should be carefully considering alternative diagnoses based on their history and physical. Of course, you should be getting their history. Uh, you're going to have to obviously get it from somebody that knows the patient, somebody around the patient, somebody who witnessed the seizure. Um, so you should be considering delirium tremens. Of course, delirium tremens, you're going to have a history of heavy alcohol use with a sudden cessation. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome is a complication of antipsychotics. So if the patient has a history of antipsychotics on their EMR or if uh, the, um, the loved one or a companion of the patient says that they are on uh, antipsychotics, then uh, you should consider neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Usually with neuroleptic malignant syndrome, the patient is very rigid. They may have fluctuating consciousness, whereas in, uh, in a tonic-clonic seizure, they're going to be unconscious. And universally in neuroleptic malignant syndrome, the patient will be febrile. They may not be febrile in a tonic-clonic seizure. You should consider drug ingestion, and that's why we're getting a toxicology screen. If the patient has needle track marks, that's another, uh, another hint that it may be drug ingestion. Uh, you may see those needle track marks while starting the IV, or the nurse may see those track marks while starting the IV, uh, but certainly they don't have to have them. And then pseudostatus epilepticus, uh, the only reason I put it in here is for completion's sake. You should never assume this diagnosis. If a patient appears to be, to be seizing, you assume they are seizing. You would never assume that a patient is faking it. And then physical exam. The reason I say this should be conducted by a second physician, if possible, is because you've already got your mind on treating the patient and on getting the history and physical um, or uh, making the diagnosis. You should have a second physician there helping you out. Um, but certainly a physical exam should be conducted during the care, if possible. After you have gotten the patient out of their seizure or you've induced anesthesia, the patient should be admitted to the ICU. Uh, neurology should be called at some point because the patient will need EEG monitoring while they're in the hospital. A more comprehensive physical examination should be done. It's going to be difficult to get a full physical while the patient is seizing, 
So you should be getting that comprehensive physical examination uh, after uh, the emergent phase has ended. What you should watch out for after uh, status epilepticus is rhabdomyolysis, which can happen just because of the, uh, of the muscle contraction and trauma. You should be looking for aspiration pneumonitis because there is a possibility of aspiration during the seizure. And you should also be looking for arrhythmia. While the patient is in the hospital, of course, like with any seizure, you should be searching for a possible cause, particularly if the patient has no history of seizures, you're going to give them their standard workup for seizures. So you should be looking for metabolic derangements, which you would see on your chemistries. You should be looking for infection, which you would see if the patient is febrile, uh, if they have an elevated white count. It's also a lot of times useful to get blood cultures and possibly a lumbar puncture. Uh, structural lesions would be noted on CT or MRI, which you should always get in any patient who's had a seizure. And uh, you'd also, uh, you should also be uh, looking for trauma, which would be uh, noted on the history or on the CT. And then drugs uh, would be noted on toxicology or history. So those are all things that can cause seizures, and anything that can cause seizures can also cause status epilepticus. So this is, for your reference, uh, this is basically everything that I said kind of put into one page as far as what you're doing and when you're doing it, uh, what you should be administering as far as medications, and your differential after care, and uh, the fact that you are never giving propofol unless you're an anesthesiologist. Remember, Michael Jackson died from that. He wasn't an anesthesiologist. Okay. So, some myths about epilepsy and seizures in general. When a patient is seizing, what do you never do? You never put anything in the patient's mouth. It is a common, common misconception that a patient could choke on their tongue. It's anatomically impossible. Mother Nature designed us with... Uh, ligaments attaching our tongue to the bottom of our mouth for a reason. So it is anatomically impossible to choke on your tongue. Never, ever, ever put anything in the patient's mouth for any reason. Also, uh, never restrain the patient. So when I say restrain the patient, I mean holding them down with all your might. Now it is certainly okay to lay the patient on their side to prevent from aspiration it is also certainly okay to cushion the patient's head to prevent their uh, to prevent their tonic clonic uh, uh, behavior from uh, causing head trauma so it's okay to cushion their head and to lean them on their side but don't ever restrain them it's also good and recommended to loosen or remove any tight or dangerous clothing around the patient's head or neck or eyes so necklaces, eyeglasses, etc. And then if you're outside the hospital or paramedical setting, you should be calling for help immediately. So this is some practical first aid stuff um, that you can uh, use as a, uh, when you're not working, when you're out in the real world. You can use this for educating patients who have epilepsy uh, educating family members of patients with epilepsy. This is all really, really good stuff to know. And this is the purple ribbon. You see this a lot of times for epilepsy awareness. And that's all I've got for you.